Before I get into the phase plug experiments, I want to talk briefly about uh, the difference between horns and waveguides. I keep getting comments on that video. It's gotten more views than the other ones I've posted lately, so you get more people coming in and, um, you know, tell me what it's all about, you know, pointing out my mistakes to me. Well, the difference between a horn and a waveguide is something very specific and we can go to the guy that you know came up with the term waveguide acoustic waveguide in the first place and see what he has to say about the difference between a horn and a waveguide because i was using a different approach and came up with different contours i didn't want to confuse the fact by calling them horns so i called them waveguides Excellent. And I, to my knowledge, I was the first person to use the term acoustic waveguide. All waveguides are horns, but not all horns are waveguides. That's the right way to say it. That's Earl Geddes, and he is the guy that coined the term waveguide to describe the type of horn that he designed. And the distinction, uh, the reason why he wanted to separate it from a horn, is that he was concentrating on something he called constant or activity. So his horns, which he called waveguides, have constant or activity, whereas a horn that doesn't have constant or activity is still a horn, <laughs> but it's not a waveguide. So like he said, all waveguides are horns, but not all horns are waveguides. At this point, my new speakers are finished and they're down in my listening room and set up and I'm using them. And I'm going to have more videos on how I set them up specifically. Probably the next one will be on uh, getting the digital crossover uh, configured for the speakers, you know, and measuring them and measuring the in-room response and all that stuff. All that fun stuff. <laughs> so in the meantime, after I did initially set them up. They're not, you know, 100% yet. I'm saving that for a recording. But I got them close and I experimented a little bit with uh, phase plugs. And of course, the first thing that I did was I set up my measurement microphone to do the recordings on axis of the tweeter. And I'm only measuring the tweeter here. And this is what it looks like stock. I'm getting a very flat response up to around 10K and then it starts to roll off slightly into a dip at around 17K. Then I came out here and I grabbed, I think is a 5 8 inch dowel. I cut it to about an inch long and I very quickly rounded over the front of it into a bullet shape. <laughs> and that's the reason why I'm calling it a bullet. And then used a piece of wire to mount that directly in front of the dome on the tweeter and ran the sweep again. And as you can see, that made a big difference. And I believe we can agree that it's not a good difference. It starts to ramp up around 10K and then sharply breaks down to 12K. And then it gradually bounces up again to 17K and then rolls off from there. So it's obvious that the bullet is not gonna do it for me, but going through my mind at this time was more of what Earl Geddes did when he was building speakers and that he had a foam plug in his waveguide and I thought that maybe I could take a piece of foam and put that in front of the dome on the tweeter and see what that does. You can see now that the response is flat and even right up to 15K, where it starts to roll off and flatten out at 19K. And here's the stock response for comparison. I forgot to take a picture of this one, but it's this stuff right here, a scotch bright pad that's about a quarter inch thick. And I cut it out into kind of a, uh, I don't know, a circular shape in, this, in the middle with arms that go up and down so I could fasten it to the outside of the horn and have it pushed in close to the dome. And this is what the response looks like. Okay, once again, I didn't get a picture of this one, but it's basically a foam again, except a bigger piece uh, that mostly covered the horn flare. And the big thing I noticed about this was how much it reduced the output. The next one is foam again, but this time I took a little bit more time to sculpt the shape of the foam and it's around the same size as the uh, foam hunk that was very roughly cut out and stuck in front of the dome but this time it seems to work better maybe it has something to do with the shape the roll off at 16k is nice and gradual but there is a little bit of a dip at 10k 
The next one is foam again, and this gives you an idea of how I cut out the Scotch-Brite pad and put that in. I cut the foam in the same shape so that it's just in front of the dome of the tweeter. Then I got to thinking about the practicality of having a, a hunk of foam floating in front of the tweeter. So you'd really want to have it in something. So I came out here to my shop and I made this thing right here, which fits into the horn flare and it has a hole in the middle. And the idea is that you put the foam in there, but I put it in the tweeter first as it is to see what the response looks like. I'm calling this the 50s tail light, and you can see without the foam that it peaks up around 11K a little bit and then falls into a hole at 17K before rising up again. Then I cut a piece of foam to fit in here and I put it in. This is not the piece. This is actually too big. I didn't have to compress it. I just slipped it in and then ran the sweep again. And you can see that the foam smoothed things out. And then I got to thinking that maybe the hole in this is too small. You know, it's a three quarter inch hole. So I came out here and I made another one. I didn't take a picture of this one in the horn, but it's, you know, exactly the same thing, except a bigger hole. So a bigger piece of foam. And I ran the measurement again. And the first measurement is with the foam put in. And then I took the foam out and ran the sweep again. Then I reduced the thickness of the foam that goes in here by half and ran the sweep again. So as you can see, you can definitely improve the measured response of the tweeter that's in a horn um, by using these methods. Uh, most promising, uh, in my opinion, is the maybe, maybe just slightly bigger than this. Maybe I made this one too big and this one's just a bit too small. So somewhere in between, say seven eighths of an inch hole with the right amount of foam to experiment with. That might be the best thing because first of all, of course, it houses the foam. So it's not just floating there, a blob of foam. And it actually looks pretty cool, <laughs> which is kind of the point of putting the horn there to begin with, right? Now I'm sure I'm going to get asked if I did any off axis measurements and I didn't. I just wanted to see what all of these look like on axis. And to be honest, it took uh, several hours to do all this. I mean, I had to come out here and make these two things. And even, you know, even just these two things would be like two days work for some people. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't do the off axis, but I can imagine that, you know, there would be an improvement, maybe possibly. It would be interesting to do like a full thing. Another thing is I didn't bother listening to any of this. If someone's going to ask me that, um, I mean, it's just one speaker playing and it's just the tweeter on one speaker. So I really couldn't, I wouldn't be able to judge. Okay. My hearing's not there. Okay. I don't know about other people, but my hearing's not there. I'm not going to hear a difference between all of these. The point of this was to show that, you know, what can be done. And speaking of what can be done, since this is a fully active digital system that I'm working with here, I have the ability to equalize and do that before, you know, it gets converted to analog. So, that's what I did. I equalized the on axis response to make it, well, I can't say optimally flat because I put limits on how much I would boost or cut. Okay. I don't want to be too extreme with that, but I did one boost, one cut, and I came up with this response right here, which is actually quite a lot better than anything I was able to accomplish with the, uh, the fancy taillights or foam or anything like that. Now this might seem like it's out of order, but what I did was I changed the mic position to 30 degrees off axis to do an off axis recording. And I turned off the EQ. And so this is the stock off axis response. And then you can see a little bit of a dip at 10 K and then it's flat right out to 17 K where it starts to roll off. And there was only a slight decrease in the output from the original stock on axis response. So for this one here, I left the mic in that 30 degrees off axis position and I turned the EQ back on and that's the response that you see right here. Objectively, this is worse than the off axis response of the stock uh, horn and tweeter. We have a deeper dip at 10 K and then it gradually humps up again around 16 K before rolling off. So I think a better way to apply equalization here would be to take the stock on axis uh, response 
and the stock off axis response and then average those together and then EQ that, you know, set your filters so that you try to flatten that response. So what you're seeing here is that average response before I do any equalization. And so here is the improved off axis equalized response that I made based on that average. And then this last one is the improved equalized on axis response. As you can see, there is an improvement over the stock on axis response, but not a huge one. All right. None of this is causing a huge improvement to the response. It's, you know, easy to see these minor deviations, but hearing it when you're listening to music is another story altogether.